Okay. So we are almost at the top of the hour, so we can start. So good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the session. Uh, my name is Ajay Lele. I work for Brocade. I'm here with two of my colleagues, uh, Kevin Wang and Ajay Jabria. And we'll be talking about the new features in BGP PSEP project in the Boron release. So BGP PSEP is actually one of the oldest project in Open Daylight. And it has been part of the ODL distribution since the first hydrogen release. But as you can expect, in every release, there are new changes, new features coming in. So this is the stuff that we'll be covering today. So support for new ITF standards that has been added in the Boron release and some enhancements and improvements that have gone in. Uh, and we have only 25 minutes uh, set out for this session, so we'll uh, you know, try to go a little faster. If you can hold your questions for the end, that will be great. Okay, so the first uh, ITF standard that is now supported in Boron is called AdPath, and it is defined in RFC 7911. Uh, the initial draft for this RFC came in 2008, and it has got converted to an official standard only this year. So this feature has been around for some time, and now it is supported in Open Daylight. Uh, so add path is actually the short form for additional paths. So that additional path board kind of gives you a hint into what that feature is all about. So as you might know, by default, BGP can carry only the best path for any given destination, and it can advertise only the best path. So the add path feature basically enables the advertisement of multiple paths for a given destination, uh, with the new path not implicitly overwriting the previous path. Right? Uh, so when I say path, it is nothing but the set of path attributes associated with a prefix. So if you look at the BGP routing information, it is nothing but the prefix or the set of prefixes and the set of attributes associated with those. So in the uh, classic BGP, without the additional paths, because uh, there, could, there can be only one prefix uh, that can be advertised, so the paths can be indexed based on the prefix. But with add path, since there could be multiple paths associated with a given prefix, there is this new entity called path identifier that has been introduced. Uh, so this path identifier is nothing but a four octet value, which is part of the NLRI. Uh, and it's a, a opaque value. It doesn't have any significance as such. It is generated by the BGP speaker, which is advertising these additional paths. And if a speaker re-advertises the path, it generates its own set of values. And these path identifier values are not persistent across uh, uh, reloads of the BGP speaker. So these are some of the rules associated to how uh, uh, the uh, prefixes are handled. So for example, a new advertisement for a given address prefix and a, ad, a given path ID replaces a previous advertisement for the same address prefix and path ID. And if a BGP speaker receives a message to withdraw, with a path ID which was not seen before, then it is silently ignored. So some rules associated with how the path identifier information is handled. OK, so what is add path feature really used for? So there are various scenarios uh, in which this feature comes in handy. Uh, so for example, uh, a restoration of connectivity in case of a failure. Uh, so if you have multiple paths, if you have information for that uh, with you, then if one of the path goes down, you can quickly fail over to the other path. Uh, it can be used for load balancing. So if you have multiple path information, you could send traffic parallelly on those paths at the same time, uh, achieving load balancing. It can be used in scenarios to re reduce the churn of routes and to reduce route oscillations under some peculiar topology conditions. So I have a small animation here which illustrates how add path comes in handy for faster uh, restoration of connectivity in case of a failure. So here you have two autonomous systems which, are, uh, which have a dual home connection with each other. Uh, so AS1 on the left side, uh, it has uh, routers uh, which are you know, connected through a route reflector which is reflecting the routes between them. And router A in that autonomous system has an eBGP connection to router E on the other side. And same with router B and router F, eBGP connection. Now let's say that router A receives a path for a given destination from router E. It's going to uh, you know, forward that path to the route reflector, which then reflects it to the other peers. right? And now uh, router B is receiving another path from router F. And let's say this path 
uh, is less preferred as compared to the previous path, maybe because it has a higher med value, for example. So uh, router B does the best path calculation, and it determines that path A is better than path B. So it's not going to advertise that path without the add path capability. So this is the uh, scenario without the add path. Uh, so this is the steady state, you know, where only the path B in the first autonomous system is aware of uh, the, uh, the, the path B, uh, whereas all others just know about the best path. So in this scenario, let's say that there is a, a failure between router A and router E, the link fails. So let's see, you know, what step, what things need to happen before the routers in the first autonomous system can start using the, uh, the uh, other path. So router A generates uh, a withdraw message, uh, sends it to the route reflector, route reflector uh, reflects it on to the other routers. When router B gets that withdraw, it does, uh, redoes the uh, path computation. And now it determines that path B is the one which is the best path. So now it will advertise that as the best path. The route reflector will reflect it. And then it reaches router C and D. They will, in turn, redo the uh, best path computation. And that's when, you know, at the end, they start using the uh, path B to forward traffic to destinations uh, you know, that, that were reachable through the second autonomous system. So it does take quite a bit of steps before the failure happens, before the router C and D start using the backup path. Now let's look at the scenario where the add path capability has been configured and enabled. So the initial sequence is the same. Uh, router A receives path A, it advertises it, the route reflector reflects it. Uh, now when router B gets the advertisement for path B, Again, it determines that it's not the best path, but this time it's going to uh, forward it to the route reflector because of the add path capability, which allows it to advertise multiple paths. So these two paths are going to have a different path ID. Uh, the route reflector gets it, it reflects it on. And so all the routers in that autonomous system essentially know about path B, but since that is not the best path, that is not the one being used, right? So this is the steady state condition. And in this state, if the same failure happens, uh, so this time again, router A sends the withdraw, route reflector reflects it on, and each of the routers redo the uh, best path algorithm. And this time, uh, they already know about path B. So they could immediately switch over to using the path B, right? And they could start using the uh, secondary path. So the number of uh, steps that need to happen is much lower. So this is one example of how additional path capability helps in the faster restoration of connectivity in case of a uh, network failure. OK, so there are different path selection modes that can be specified when you configure additional paths. And based on the use case that you're trying to solve, you can pick the corresponding uh, path selection mode. So the path selection mode basically specifies how many paths the BGP speaker will advertise. Uh, so there are various strategies which are uh, specified in the draft, advertise all paths, advertise n paths, and so on. So out of these five which are covered by the draft, the first two, which is add n and add all, are currently covered by the Open Daylight code. Uh, so these are some more details about the add path capability itself. Uh, it defines a new capability type uh, uh, with value 69. And this is exchanged during the initial handshake when the BGP connection is being established. And a speaker could uh, advertise the capability to receive additional paths, send additional paths, or both. And this can be done on a per address family basis. So you could uh, advertise for one address family and not the other. So this is what the uh, you know, format and the payload looks like. The NLRI TLV itself, uh, so earlier it was just the prefix length and the prefix. So now we are adding this uh, four byte add path value. So this is how it looks like now. So you have the four byte path identifier and then the prefix length and then the prefix. Just one thing to be careful about is the Wireshark may not be able to interpret it correctly, dissect it correctly, because uh, traditionally it expects just the prefix length and the prefix value. 
but now it has this extra four octet value. So I actually found there was a, a patch submitted to Wireshark many years back in I think 2011 or something, which was supposed to add the support for additional path capability for V4 prefixes so that the dissection happens properly. But somehow I mean, it doesn't seem to be working very well. So if you look at the uh, Wireshark snapshot, you could see that the NLRI is you know, uh, interpreted in a wrong way. I mean, you see some uh, prefi wrong prefixes being listed. So this is just one thing to be careful about when you're looking at Wireshark to debug this. Okay, so um, how to enable it in Open Daylight? So by default, additional path capability is disabled, so you need to explicitly go and enable it. And there are multiple ways it can be done. So this example is by editing the 41 BGP config XML file. You could do the same thing in Boron using the Open Config API. Uh, so there are some sections which are commented by default, which you need to uncomment to enable it. So one of the things you do is uh, uh, select the uh, uh, path selection mode that you're interested in, whether it's N path or all paths. And if it is N path, you specify how many paths you want to be selected. And these are some, you know, screenshots of, uh, you know, relevant things uh, in Open Daylight, just showing the add path thing in action. So on the left hand side, you see that the uh, there's a new type defined for the path ID, uh, which is unsigned in 32. It's a four octet value, and in the uh, route model itself. Earlier it was indexed just based on the prefix, but now you can see that it's indexed based on the prefix as well as the path ID. And on the right hand side, it's just a sample restconf output which shows uh, a route in the adjacent ribbon, which now shows the path ID along with the prefix and other path attributes. So this is just to give you an idea like uh, you know, how things look in practice. Any questions on this? Okay, so let's move to the next one, which is the route refresh. So route refresh is uh, uh, defined in RFC 2918, which came out way back in the year 2000. So those who are familiar with BGP, those who have used BGP must already know, I mean, it's a well-known feature. Uh, so essentially what it provides uh, the capability to the BGP speaker to request its peer to resend the routing information to it. Uh, so the typical sequence will be like this. You have two BGP speakers which have a connection between them, and they exchange the route refresh capability during the open message exchange initially. And then if speaker one wants speaker two to resend the routing updates that it has sent initially, it sends a route refresh message and it gets back the set of routing updates from the peer. A quick look at why route, route refresh capability is required. So looking at the BGP RIP pipeline, so uh, the prefixes that are received from the peer go into the adjacent ribbon. From there, the import policy is applied. Then you would run the best path selection algorithm. The routes go into the lock rib. And from there, you would apply the export policy, put them into the adjacent rib out. And that's, from there, it goes to the other peers you know, that you might have configured. So this is the typical you know, flow of the sequence basically in the way the prefixes are handled. So let's say that the uh, import policy changes at some point. And if the initial uh, processing of the prefixes has already happened, you need to redo the uh, you know, processing uh, as per the new import policy. And for that, you ne uh, need the contents of the adjacent ribbon one more time. And there are a couple of different ways in, in which it can be achieved. So one is you could do a hard reset of the connection between the router and the uh, ODL. So when the connection is broken and reestablished, you get these uh, prefixes again uh, when the connection gets reestablished. But this has a negative side effect of causing a disturbance in the network, which you may not want. The other option is to uh, do a soft reset. So in this case, the BGP speaker holds on to the contents of the adjacent ribbon so that it can reapply the import policy if it changes. But that has a drawback of uh, you know, needing more resources to store the adjacent ribbon, right? And so the third option is the route refresh, basically. So you don't have to do a hard reset. You don't have to store those prefixes, the pre-policy prefixes. So you don't you know, waste resources uh, storing those. 
but what you can do is just on demand whenever you ne need the routes again you send a route refresh and the peer sends it back to you uh, again some details related to route refresh uh, it defines a new capability with type 2 uh, and the route refresh is not advertised on a per address family basis and if a route refresh capability is ex uh, advertised it basically indicates the willingness of that bgp speaker to accept route refresh messages from the peer. This is how the route refresh request message looks like. Uh, it's, it has BGP type 5 and you specify what address family that you are interested in uh, getting the prefixes for from the peer. Okay, so route refresh as of Boron is uh, supported by default. There is no special configuration that you need to, uh, to enable it. Uh, so this is as far as handling the route refresh request from the peer uh, and there is a new R RPC that has been added in Open Daylight as part of the uh, BGP peer RPC model uh, which enables you to generate a route refresh request. So from the ODL if you want to send a route refresh request to the peer and have the peer send all the routing information again, you could use that RPC and that RPC essentially takes uh, three things, the address family and the IP address of the peer or identifier of the peer from which you want the route, uh, route to receive the routes. <coughs> Any questions so far? Okay. Uh, thank you, Ajayal. So, uh, in Boron, we have uh, two types of address families that have been introduced. The first one is the eVPN and the second one is the L3 VPN. So uh, basically why eVPN? Why eVPN was chosen over technologies like VPLS? The reason eVPN was chosen is the first thing is all the MAC address learning has been happening through the control plane. So this control plane, when you think of, uh, our SDN controller suits well in that control plane thing. So it also gives the grip to control the policies, to decide what to, what MAC addresses to be forwarded, what not to be forwarded. And uh, it, it also helps in things like fast convergence, split horizon. And if you, um, you, you can use this eVPN protocol, basically with uh, provider backbone bridge, that helps to summarize these MAC addresses. So this helps in basically scaling. And uh, how we are achieving all these things? So this is achieved using a new uh, extension of the BGP protocol, which is the multi-protocol BGP, MP BGP, that also tags the MPLS labels along with the MAC addresses. So uh, we'll just see how it looks like. So say, for example, these are your PE routers in in an MPLS network, they could be connected with each other through either MPLS GRE or IPGRE. And each eVPN instance consists of a CE router uh, connected to the PE. So you guys must be thinking, okay, this is fine. We have been seeing all this in the traditional environment. Where is the SDN controller? So here is where it sits. It listens to all the MAC addresses learned by the PE routers. And, you know, you can uh, have, since the REST APIs are exposed, the application, if there are any application running on the top of uh, the controller, uh, you can simply, you know, try to build your own application and have the client services, uh, you know, uh, like if you are planning to have an external extranet services or the L2 VPN services, uh, it, it will become very easier uh, for any uh, application to sit on the top of it. So uh, here, I'll be just running it quickly. So you must be seeing there's, uh, in the table, it shows MAC, it shows ESI, which is the Ethernet segment identifier, and it shows the next top information. So we need to understand what is the significance of ESI. So say, for example, we have this multi-homing uh, capability wherein there are two links between C and P, and both are active. And when the CE sends the data to the PE, 
say for example we consider PE1 as the designated forwarder and PE2 as a non-designated forwarder. So in that case, the designated forwarder should not send the packet back to the C. And that is where ESI helps us. And that is why ESI helps us to identify the segment origination, like from which segment this packet was originated from. So this is nothing but the split horizon functionality uh, that we have. I'll be talking about fast convergence as I mentioned in my previous slide, but I'll show it along with the routes that the controller can be used, controller can use to inject the routes below. So it will be in my further slides. So in the next slide you see how do we configure things uh, on the controller and uh, there is an open config model that Kevin will be talking uh, further about. So this is how we configure the BGP speaker wherein we mention the router ID, the autonomous system number and introduce this L2E VPN address family. And this is how we configure the BGP peer, wherein we uh, include the neighbor IP addresses. So as I mentioned, uh, in the types of eVPN routes, uh, uh, like these are the various types of eVPN routes that are supported today in the Boron release. So uh, to start with, I spoke about ESI, why we need ESI to identify the segment. Uh, and you must be wondering how come it is having a VLAN ID of a long number. It is not exactly the VLAN. We all know VLANs are from, we, are just, we just know that there are 4096 VLANs, but it is nothing but a segment ID, which has been represented in the, in the Yang model of VLAN ID thing. And on the right, there is uh, the Ethernet AD per VLANs. So, so uh, you must be observing in these two things, we have the MPLS labeled tags along uh, with these eVPN routes. And uh, there is also an extension of MAC IP advertisement and uh, multicast Ethernet tags. So let's under try to understand how will fast convergence help us here. So if I go back into uh, my, my diagram out here, so we observe there is a, there's a special type of eVPN route called as Ethernet AD route, which is nothing but the auto discovery route. So what it does is it does nothing but it installs on all the PEs a backup route. So say for example, there is a particular route information that has been deleted. It stores them in the forwarding uh, information base, which is the FIB. And once uh, there is any failure, you know, using that information that it learned through Ethernet AD, which is right here, it will help to identify and help for fast convergence. So, you, you know, the controller already can, you know, before, if there's any failure, controller can inject those routes beforehand on all the P's and help in fast convergence. So, uh, so three things we learned here. Uh, first is everything is will be happening through the control plane. We have, we will be having the good grip, there will be no, uh, you know, complex concepts of VPLS like AC, pseudo wires, and all those things, no complications. Uh, so how are we running on time? Uh, okay, so I need to rush on the extended communities. So extended communities is nothing but uh, the extension of the community attribute that we have in BGP. Uh, so think of this way as it is like, uh, uh, in communities, we just give the number of prefixes to be passed. So extended communi uh, communities like helps us to uh, provide the label information. It helps to label, uh, the, you know, add the label information in the BGP route. So say for example, if I want to uh, have the VXLAN support out here, that's what I've highlighted here. You can send those VXLAN routes along with this VVPN thing and uh, get things working. So this is a sample. Uh, route injection payload that we use in our controller. And if you see, we have this MPLS label tag, we have the VLAN information. You can also use the link aggregation control protocol information based on your use cases. Uh, so maybe I missed the slides. So based on your use cases, there could be various types of segment identifiers. You can have the segment identifiers based on router ID, if it is like uh, in your in your network, if you have an indirectly connected host via bridged LAN, uh, there is uh, the payload for that. Link aggregation control protocol is also used, and there's also a nine octet ESI value, which is arbitrary. You can just put in your own data in there. Uh, 
Uh, and if it is like autonomous system based ESI, you can use payloads like these. And uh, yes, so we covered the extended communities. We understood how to insert it. So let's switchly, uh, quickly switch our gears to L3 VPN. So in L3 VPN, it is nothing but, uh, but think of this way that the data packets are tunneled through the backbone uh, routers, you know, in, in, in the core MPLS network. So in this case, the core routers doesn't know, need to know about what VPN routes need to be forwarded. So it has been, again, using MPBGP, and it is more like a client, uh, like if you have a client running on the top of the controller, think of it like an application who wants to trigger an, a VPN service or an extranet service. You know, it would be easier to use REST cons using Yang models and uh, get the services uh, through the routers which are now uh, where the brains from the routers are gone to the controller. So, you know, just tell the routers whatever you want to, what want them to uh, take the service from them. So, and again, it is helping us in scalability and flexibility pattern. Uh, one thing I would like to highlight here is VPN here is happening, uh, providing a service with the overlapping uh, address space. So if you ha say, for example, you can have the address space which are which could be overlapping. So how it is happening, it uses this route distinguisher concept. So say for example, I have a VPN route of say for example 2.2.2.0 slash 24. I can uh, tag in a route distinguisher, distinguisher value in front of the prefix and that will be identified uh, where it is supposed to be destined. And, and route targets basically uh, is used to import and export routes out of the virtual routing forwarding uh, VRFs in the router. It is nothing but the 8-byte eight, eight extended community attribute. So let's try to understand how would it look uh, for the L3 VPN. So say for example we have two data centers connected uh, in two different locations and there's a VPN A service which is the IP VPN service and in this case, the C info Cs out here are passing in the information to the controller. The controller is doing nothing but talking MPBGP protocol that tags in the MPLS label information. So this helps us to integrate the control plane and the data plane, uh, you know, uh, interconnection between them. So when the MPLS labels are being sent uh, using RT value, so route targets will be sent based on what VRF it is subscribed to. So say for example, if it is subscribed to VRF RT1, it will go to VRF RT1 within the router. So within the router, you can have like tons of VRFs. And then you can encapsulate the data through the IP data through uh, the tunnel, uh, through MPLS over GRE or whatever uh, your use case is. Uh, and again, the configuration pattern is the same here uh, between uh, the speaker and the peer. And this is the sample information uh, that the controller can use to inject uh, the VPN to, or to create a VPN uh, on the underlying network, wherein it passes the label stack value, which is the nothing but the MPLS label. It, it sends the route distinguisher value. Uh, it sends the prefixes uh, and the next top information, along with whether what the, what's the origin was, whether it is IGP or EGP based on um, whatever you want. Yeah, um, I can. I don't have time to ask questions, but I'll switch, the, uh, switch, switch gears with Kevin. So thank you, guys. Um, so I think we have already run all time, so I will quickly talk about that. The BGP statistic part is already existing in the Berlin, but we kind of extend it in the um, Boron. So if you ever use this BGP CRI command in the graph, you will see this kind of output. It's basically a statistic of like, right now what's the AS number, how many routes you have for this BGP peer. Uh, and uh, in Boron, we extend it. So we will have more statistic like uh, for each rib, how many perfects we have and uh, uh, for each AFI, um, SAFI, how many perfects you have. And uh, we actually also show um, the config 
BGP peer count and uh, also how many BGP peer is actually connected. Um, so that is the sample output, and that that output is actually out, um, um, through the Jalokia. If you have ever um, use that one, um, right now uh, the BGP CLI unfortunately is not uh, well supported in Borom, um, so we will fix that later. And uh, I will quickly go through the open config. Uh, open config is uh, is supported in Brilliant, but it's just uh, some basic support. And uh, in Boron, we actually support uh, improve it to use the data store instead of uh, use the CSS, uh, which is a config subsystem. So if you trying to use uh, open config in Brilliant, it will generate the uh, uh, controller dot current config dot xml and uh, that is not uh, very good for upgrade if you want to upgrade from brilliant say uh, to borrow or bring to uh, from sr1 to sr2 so right now in borrow it's actually use data store and uh, you can totally use uh, rest conf to configure that and uh, um, you can actually read the operational data through the rest conf um, and here is a link to the latest borrow doc, but uh, because of time, I will uh, I will not open it. And uh, one thing to note is that we also uh, trying to migrate the BGP piece to use blueprint. So in borrow, it's not uh, it is not recommend to use a forty one BGP example file anymore. Um, so um, actually, if you look at the new Boron doc user, user guide, we totally recommend you to use Open Config API to configure anything. Uh, so you do not need to restart the controller when, when you want to configure the BGP peer or the BGP rep. And uh, there's also we provide the back forward, uh, backward compatibility. Uh, so, so you still need, uh, you still can configure the BGP rep or BGP peer through the 41 XML file. Uh, um, so right now the mechanism is, um, if you have configured the BGP peer there, and uh, open config, it will basically merge the 41 config file with whatever submit, uh, whatever data you have submit through the rest conf. Uh, through open config and uh, generate a new one. And so it's kind of uh, merged uh, to config file. Yeah. Do, you, do you want to talk about it? Yeah, so the last feature that we had was high availability, but uh, we are already pretty much out of time. So to be fair to the next set of speakers who are already here, uh, so the slides will be available on the wiki. Uh, so you can go take a look. So essentially, basically, it uses the singleton app service that is uh, available in Boron to implement high availability for the uh, ODL nodes when it is pairing with the BGP speaker. Right, thank you. Yeah, we can take questions in the hallway if you want.